being able to separate school and home is probably the most challenging part of this remote education, especially for our youngest learners. And it is probably one of the things we talk about the most at school, right? Doing school from home is hard. It is hard for students, it is hard for teachers, and it is hard for parents and guardians. School and home used to be two really separate places, different rules, different expectations. And now kiddos are trying to do school from home and there's this constant struggle trying to figure out my school, my at home, whose rules or expectations are more important right now. And this takes up a lot of mental energy. It makes it really challenging for students to be able to focus on their teacher, on their class, on their work. Um, it also doesn't help that it can feel like there is never a break from school since now you basically live there, right? The biggest tip that I hear from teachers is to establish a designated school space to help your student really easily differentiate between school and home. Now, I know this is pretty much elementary perspective is maybe not pertinent to middle and high schoolers. So just to keep that in mind. And also I know that some of our students are back in the building in the mornings, but they are still doing some remote learning on Wednesdays and in the afternoon. So this can still be a little helpful for them. But their school spot doesn't have to be elaborate at all. Truly, you can just use some blue tape and mark off a spot that says, this is where the learning happens. This would be where their device and their charger and their supplies live. It's great if it is as distraction free as possible, which is not always easy given that at home there are toys and siblings and pets and parents working from home. Trust me, no teacher is expecting perfection on this front, especially since some of them are dealing with some of the exact same issues setting up their teaching spots at home. Uh, all of this is sort of in that making the best of a difficult situation mindset. So um, the idea is just that it is helpful for kiddos to be able to really easily distinguish between what is home and what is school so that they can focus on the important learning things. There are moments, of course, when we need to be flexible. We always need to be flexible um, that they might be doing an independent reading or maybe a bigger art project of some sort and maybe in their learning spot is not going to be practical, right? It's probably okay to do your independent reading laying on the couch or you might need the dining room table to spread out all of your supplies to do a project. But for the most part, if we can sort of find them a designated spot to do their learning, that's what makes it the easiest for them. Being able to separate your role as a parent from your role as being the school enforcer or the homeschool helper is the other really challenging part of remote learning. Being their parent is by far the most important part. That's my opinion, obviously. I'm the counselor, so I would think that. And given that our brains have been overwhelmed with stress chemicals and hormones for the past year, everyone's current mental state is less than optimal. There are going to be moments of frustration and annoyance and anger on both sides, parents, kids, okay, all sides, teachers, everyone, right? I can't tell you enough how important it is to take some time after one of those moments to repair your relationship, right? After a tense moment or a disagreement, take some time. Secret tip, this also works with spouses and your parents and the grocery store checker. But when you are both feeling calmer, it's super important to apologize and then reaffirm your child's feelings. This is a great learning opportunity, right? We get to model what a sincere apology looks like, how we manage our own big feelings when we're having them, frustration and anger, how do we deal with that? What would be acceptable? What is a, a positive choice for how to deal with those feelings? And then learning some different strategies for conflict resolution, problem solving, compromise. Right? The other trick to maintaining a strong relationship with your child is um, when that teachers use a lot. So when we're at school, we have this goal to give five positive statements for every corrective statement. And one trick that teachers use sometimes would be to put five things like paper clips or something in your pocket. And then every time you give a child some kind of a positive comment, you get to move a paper clip to your other pocket. So it helps you keep track a little more easily than just thinking, oh, I'm sure that I gave them five positive comments, right? It can be really hard to keep track. Even if things are going really well at home, I always think this is kind of a fun experiment just to see. My only warning is that it's really helpful to be actually authentic and sincere because kids are experts at knowing when adults are being fake or insincere and then it doesn't really work. For 
first and absolutely most importantly, if you believe that you or your child is dealing with a serious mental health concern, please reach out to your school counselor or Issaquah School District has a Swedish school-based mental health counselors and there's one assigned to each school. They are listed on the district website and I will be sure to get that information so it can get posted uh, below somewhere. Um, can't say it enough, life right now is not easy. Just because we are struggling does not mean that we are weak. We are social beings that need to feel connection and belonging. and We are not meant to survive alone. We need each other. And I believe that asking for help is a sign of strength. I also believe that everyone should have their own therapist, but that is the counselor and me talking. All that being said, I can't stress enough the power of social connection. Finding ways to encourage engagement for your kiddo is critical. And it might just be encouraging them to turn on their camera in class or setting up a virtual video game time with their friends. Uh, maybe it's setting aside time for your family to just play. Whatever it is that you love to do together, board games, puzzles, hikes, just being sure that you are fully present and connected for that time. So, and it could just be 10 minutes, it, not a big deal, right? It doesn't have to be a huge ordeal. It's just being sure that there are some times of authentic connection in your day. Also, the weather is getting nicer. So maybe you are feeling more comfortable with your kiddos playing outside with their friends or starting sports again. Whatever way it is that is working for your family to seek social connection is the best way. The other idea, which is super basic and is really easy to kind of ignore, is thinking about taking care of your bodies, getting enough sleep, getting a little movement in your day, being sure to remember to eat and drink. I know that it can be really easy to sort of brush those things off, but I promise that they have a giant impact on brain function and mood. So maybe start small. Try setting up a regular bedtime routine or having a friendly family competition to see who has the most active minutes each day, right? You just have a post-it and jot that down. Again, whatever way it is that is working best for your family is absolutely the right way. That just makes me smile. I absolutely adore seeing them and it is just brought a whole new level of sort of joy and excitement and energy at, at, to the building. But to be honest, there are lots of mixed emotions across the board. I mean, everyone has different comfort levels with how they are feeling safe from students and families to teachers. We definitely have students who are super aware what their six foot bubble looks like and get really self-conscious, they're really aware and they get really nervous when people are inside of their six feet. Um, so it just means that there are lots of people who are feeling nervous and excited all at the same time. Having the students back on campus also means a lot more pivoting for staff and families and more transitions and adjustments for students. Teachers are adapting and learning new ways to teach. Families are adding the health attestation to their morning routines and juggling their schedules to be sure they can pick their kiddos up at 1230. And the kiddos, some of them are switching teachers and classmates and are learning all new rules about what school looks like. All of this change and uncertainty is exhausting and it is overwhelming for everyone that is involved. But in the end, we are always so excited to see those sweet little faces, whether that's in person on Zoom, that it just makes all the hard parts worth it. The question of how the community can support faculty and families for the rest of the school year is um, super personal and emotional question for me. I feel like I have a really unique position on this question because I get to hear from students and families and staff, but I also have lived in the community for 15 years, so I, I get to hear that side as well. Every day, every day, I hear a new heartbreaking story from a family about how their child is struggling, or I see one of my colleagues break down because they are working themselves into the ground to make this work for their students. I know that there isn't one solution that fixes this for everyone. So I, I guess I just have two, two big asks for our community and that includes families and staff for sure. The first ask is that we just please show our children what kindness and perseverance look like in action. 
These are two things that I am absolutely passionate about teaching our students and I can use all the help I can get. I promise you they are little sponges and they learn more from seeing it in real life than I can possibly teach them in a class lesson. So if you can talk that out loud, like it's a hard day, what am I doing to help me keep going? Like, I'm frustrated, but how can I do this in a kind way? What are some kind things I could do for my neighbor or our community or each other in our family? Right? Teaching those kiddos perseverance and kindness are two really important life skills that will take them way further in life in a lot of ways. And then my second ask is that we just really take care of each other. We take care of people's feelings. We really take the time to think about what the impact of our messages and if the impact of our messages and actions match what our intention is, that how we wanted people to feel, is that what we wanted them to understand, is that what we were saying? And then take care of your neighbors, take care of your families, take care of yourselves. I know that it has been a whole year of this, and that none of us are functioning as our very best self. We feel defeated and exhausted and hopeless most days. But we are all in this together and we all want what is best for our children. And the only way to get there is to do this work together. I, I know it sounds completely trite to say it, but we actually are better together. And finally, please remember that as a super wise fifth grader once told me, kindness is always an option.